All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for this very interesting talk. And so we have with us uh, Wendy Goldman, who is a social and political historian of Russia. Her early work focused on women's emancipation and industrialization. She wrote about Stalinist repression in <clears throat> terror and democracy in the age of Stalin, the social dynamics of repression as well as Inventing the Enemy, Pronunciation, and Terror in Stalin's Russia. The latest work with Donald Filter, Fortress Darling Stern, the Soviet Home Front in World War II, is the first comprehensive study of the Soviet Home Front and its role in the Allied victory in World War II. So please join me in welcoming uh, Wendy. I will be part of part one. Well, I want to first of all thank you all for uh, giving me the opportunity here today to talk to you a little bit about uh, some of the findings from uh, Fortress Dark and Stern. And for those of you who may be interested, uh, the book covers a lot more topics, of course, than the one I'm going to talk about today. So it also covers, in addition to evacuation, um, the rationing system, uh, living conditions, labor mobilization, propaganda, and the liberation of the occupied territories. It's actually the first full overview of the Soviet home front in English that's based uh, almost entirely on archival sources. So it's bringing to light a lot of new materials, I think, that uh, we did not have access to before. So before I begin to talk about um, the feet that won the war. Uh, I wanted to situate this talk a little bit within some of the larger questions about um, the uh, debates over the role of the Soviet Union in World War II. And so you have just some sense of, of what are the kind of big questions that animate this subject. So one of the big issues is the whole question of preparedness, what's known as, was the Soviet Union prepared for? Um, most of you may know that the first 18 months of the war, actually, until Stalingrad, almost until Stalingrad, was a, a disaster in the sense that the Red Army was in retreat. Um, and uh, Khrushchev, in 1956, in his famous uh, talk at the 20th Party Congress, did uh, absolutely excoriating critique of Stalin's wartime leadership. And that was where that idea of the lack of preparedness was really introduced uh, within the Soviet Union. And Khrushchev's argument basically, in essence, was uh, had the Soviet Union been prepared, then the losses would not have been as great. So that's one of the questions. Was the Soviet Union prepared? Was it not prepared? Was the military disaster as great as it seems? perhaps to the lay person, was it not? And then of course, what went on on the home front? How does preparedness figure into that? The second thing that is a big subject of debate is this was an enormous victory. I think we can all recognize that. And um, who was responsible for it? So prior to, I would say, Khrushchev, there was this sense um, that it was really the organizational efforts and acumen of the Communist Party and the state uh, that were responsible for leading the people to victory. Uh, after Khrushchev, that emphasis shifted. And then what we had was this notion, actually, wasn't really the party of the state, it was the people. Now, of course, how, what exactly that means, uh, who organized the people, uh, et cetera, kind of still an open question. <laughs> That became a kind of uh, ongoing debate. And then under Brezhnev, things shifted back to party and state. And now under Putin, the war is also being uh, you know, used in, in many, many ways. Uh, and I would say the party has fallen off of the table, uh, but um, certainly uh, the state uh, is seen as you know, a great force in the victory. So this whole issue. A third issue. The war cannot help but be looked at as a litmus test for popular support for the regime. So everyone here, uh, you know, who's read even a little bit of history knows that war 
uh, can produce revolution. The hardships, the taxation, all of that. I mean, going way back in time, any of you could probably give me on any number of examples. Uh, France, the 1789, the French Revolution. Um, the Russian Revolution in 1917, World War I. Uh, Germany in 1918, uh, again, World War I. Uh, even the United States during the Vietnam War, for those of you who remember, this country was rocking. And um, it really looked in certain places as if, you know, it was on the verge of a uh, revolution, uh, primarily the coasts. But, you know, there was a lot going on, again, sparked by the war. So in this case, though, despite tremendous suffering, hardship, famine, difficulties of daily life, there were, there, there were no major protests uh, about the war, and actually there was widespread support. Not everywhere, everyone, but overwhelmingly, yes, on the home front. So why? What were people fighting for? What were they sacrificing for? And here again, we have a number of lots of different answers. Um, one, it was Russian nationalism. In other words, Russia itself had been attacked by the Germans and their allies, and it was Russian nationalism. Two, no, it wasn't Russian nationalism. It was Soviet nationalism or Soviet patriotism. Other peoples fought too. As you all know, the Soviet Union was a multinational uh, entity composed of uh, Ukrainians, Central Asians, Belarusians, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, that other peoples fought also, and that people were fighting not for Russia, they were fighting for the Soviet Union. A uh, third explanation, um, people were fighting for socialism. The revolution was only 20 years past, uh, and especially in the factories among the workers, there was a sense that they were fighting to defend the revolution. And that, that a lot of those ideas, I think, were particularly in evidence uh, at Stalingrad uh, among the soldiers and among the people that were there. So that people were fighting in this you know, Manichaean battle, fascism versus socialism. Uh, and that's how ideologically people understood things, and that's what they were fighting for. And then, of course, the sort of subset of fighting for socialism is support for Stalin himself. Uh, he was seen as a great and strong leader, uh, and there was an enormous amount of support actually for Stalin. Okay, so those are some of the, let's just say, big questions, big ideas, and um, you can think a little bit about that as I kind of narrow down and talk a little bit about uh, this situation. So very few people in the West uh, know very much about the role of the Soviet Union in World War II, and actually even fewer know about what happened on the home front. Why? Well, most of this history has been hidden, I would say, from Americans, actually hidden uh, because of the Cold War. So if you take a look at high school textbooks, or if you take a look at even what's taught in colleges, what's in newspapers, journalists, um, that whole history tends to be elided because for many years, uh, beginning in the you know, 1950s, it was impossible to really say we were allies once and the Soviet Union played a tremendous role in the war against fascism, if not the major role. It was just impossible to say. And of course, the second reason I think is because until the early 1990s, the Soviet archives were closed uh, to researchers, both uh, in um, the Soviet Union and in the West. So a lot of the material that went into this book, uh, it was impossible to see. After the 1990s, when the archives began to open up, incredibly exciting period, uh, people began going over and just finding all of this phenomenal material. Uh, so that too, I think, was a, we were able to shed light on topics that previously we just really didn't know that much about. So I think as a result of these, let's just say, blanks uh, in um, the history, Many of my students, for example, 
uh, who learn about World War II in school never learn that um, 26 to 27 million Soviet citizens died in the war. I mean, it's a shocking, shocking statistic um, that large swaths of the country were occupied, that about one third of the Jews who perished in the Holocaust were murdered by the Nazis on Soviet soil in a Holocaust that was different than what happened uh, in Poland. And that the overwhelming number of German divisions were concentrated on the Eastern Front. That's where the Red Army was fighting. The US Army was not fighting on the Eastern Front. Uh, so again, these are just very, very basic facts. And that according to every military historian, that it was here on the Eastern Front, where the battles were being waged by the Red Army, that the Red Army broke the back of the Wehrmacht. So we have, I think, uh, a body of military literature that's focused on the great events, but we have actually very little scholarship um, on uh, the whole thing and what happened there. So today I want to talk about one of the greatest feats of the war, maybe the greatest feat, maybe one of the greatest feats, um, but one that's not known very well in the West. And it was this feat that made the victory of the Red Army possible. Arguably in this sense, given that it made the victory of the Red Army possible, we could say it was the greatest feat of the war. And that feat was the evacuation of Soviet industry, people, grain, and herds of animals from the territory that was occupied by the Nazis in the course of 1941-1942. So this is a frontline map. And you can also see the key, for those of you that want us to begin to sign with a little bit, the key is right there. Uh, in your upper right hand corner. And what it shows us is the retreat of the Red Army, beginning with the invasion on June 22nd, 1941, up to December of that same year. And you can actually see the results of the Blitzkrieg in the first two weeks of the war. Just take a look at the key. It's sort of showing you what territory is taken when. We can see that in the first two weeks, a good portion of Belarusia, uh, Latvia, Lithuania were occupied. By the fall, the Germans had advanced to the right bank of the Dnieper River, uh, Zaporozhye and Dnipropetrovsk, two of the major iron and steel producing cities uh, were occupied. In other words, the basis for armaments industry. The Germans had occupied most of the Black Sea coast and Crimea, and they were in striking distance of Moscow. You can see that too, see how close they came. Um, the last land link to Leningrad, if you take a look up there in the far, far north, right in the middle of the map, uh, you will see that the last land link to Leningrad was severed on September 8th, and that millions of people in the city were then beginning to starve to death. The women made the decision to basically just encircle the city and let it die of starvation, which it began to do. Now, most of the country's industry, its mines, its steel plants, its food factories, its electrical power plants were concentrated in the West. And that territory that the Germans occupied between June 41 and fall of 42, so a little bit beyond what this map is showing you, contained 40% of the Soviet Union's pre-war population, a good portion of the people, and almost 32,000 industrial enterprises, so a huge number of production factory uh, uh, industry. Within literally two days of the invasion, so on June 24th, the government created a new body. It was called the Soviet for Evacuation, and it was given the charge of res rescuing machinery, people, grain, cultural treasures, 
that were in the path of the invaders. That was the charge. I'll call it the SC, the Soviet for evacuation. Evacuation lasted a little over a year, and it occurred in two phases. The first phase uh, is the map, um, which goes from June to December of 1941. And then there was a second, smaller phase in the summer and fall of 1942, uh, as the Red Army lost more territory in the south and uh, retreated back toward the Volga River. After the victory of Stalingrad in uh, the beginning of uh, 1943, evacuation was no longer necessary. And as you all know, Stalingrad was the turning point. After that, the Red Army began fighting its way back west. Three. So by December of 1941, that first big phase of evacuation, up to 17 million people, and about 20, that's about 22% of the population, and 37% of the pre-war value of the industrial enterprises were evacuated from territory that was soon to be occupied by the Nazis. And here you can see a photograph of what it looked like. People uh, who are being evacuated uh, basically stepping into boxcars. People were evacuated. They traveled in what were known as Tepushki. These were, and that's probably typical of the way uh, they looked, um, they were heated. Okay, so thank goodness for that. But they had no seats, no luggage racks, they had no toilets, and they had no water supply. Um, so people basically, there was usually a bucket in the corner of the, uh, of the box car, or people relieved themselves in between uh, the box cars. And uh, this was really hard travel. Um, they, uh, Workers traveled in echelons or in um, groups linked to train cars uh, with the factories that they had packed up and loaded in crates. So they often had even harder journeys. Uh, they were in um, uh, box cars, literally with the machines that they had just uh, packed up. The evacuation of the industrial base was an absolutely audacious feat. It was unprecedented in the history of warfare, and it required great organizational coordination by the SE, the railways, and the industrial commissariats. So we're thinking now we've got over a thousand mile front, and the Germans are moving very, very fast. Uh, and how to pack up and move out and just coordinate the delivery of boxcars uh, in order to get machinery, people, grain out of these areas was an enormous organizational group. It was also a feat, I think, that required very great courage uh, on the part of the workers who made it possible. This would not have been possible without people on the ground who did the work. Um, never had any state uh, either in peacetime or wartime succeeded in evacuating an entire industrial base, transporting it and reconstructing it thousands of miles to the east uh, alongside millions of people, tons of grain, foodstocks, and even herds. And if you want to some way to think a little bit about this in terms of scale, uh, Think about what happened in New Orleans with Hurricane Katrina and about trying to get people out of there. I mean, we just failed miserably. That was one city, one place, small population. So that just gives you some sense, I think, of both the what's involved in doing something like this uh, in wartime along a thousand mile front. Slide four. So that's a woman railway worker. And if you look at her face and look closely, I think you get an idea of the, both the determination and also the difficulty of, uh, of what this, what was going on. 
And you also see some open cars, uh, flat cars now, just piled with stuff <clears throat> as the, they're heading out. Factory workers dismantled and packed up the plants. So they received the orders from the SE. The SE ordered the boxcars to arrive at the plants. And then workers began uh, dismantling the machinery and putting it into crates. A lot of this occurred under severe bombing. So it wasn't as if they had the opportunity to do this slowly, you know, uh, carefully uh, in a situation where they weren't under enormous duress. Um, they loaded machinery, they loaded raw materials, they lo loaded uh, finished and semi-finished products onto the rail cars. The Germans were bombing the railway stations. They were also bombing the plants. So the, there would be bombing and fires. The workers would uh, leave the factories. Uh, and then um, as soon as the bombing stopped, they would come back in and start the loading again. They worked around the clock and they often were just sleeping in the factories next to the machines as everything was getting packed up. The railway workers also had to do uh, an enormous amount of both the uh, creative um, sort of figuring things out as well as, of course, just round the clock kind of work. Um, they had to improvise all kinds of new methods of loading the machinery. So some of the presses, for example, on the steel plants, they weighed hundreds of tons, transporting it to the railroad stations. And then they had uh, loading platforms that couldn't hold the weight. So again, how do you, all this improvisation was occurring uh, by people like the person we're looking at right here to try to figure out how can we get this done. So every day, I think, was just full of an enormous amount of uh, challenges. Um, in addition, think about the coordination necessary to deliver boxcars to factories, which are going to be heading east, at the same time that the railway lines are being used by the military to deliver troops to the West. So all of this, you've got rail cars moving east, west with troops, then troops unloading, moving west with uh, people and um, uh, machinery. Uh, all of this was, uh, it was a huge, huge organizational task for the railroads. Evacuation, in a sense, was made necessary by military defeat, territorial loss, but it ultimately enabled the Soviet Union to continue to produce the coal, the iron, the steel, the armaments beyond the reach of enemy bombers. So these uh, boxcars were taken thousands of miles east and set up uh, beyond the Ural Mountains in Siberia and also toward the south. Uh, in a sense, without evacuation, I think it would have been difficult for the Soviet Union to have won. And so in a way, it's an interesting kind of feat. It's a feat that is shaped by a sort of tragic dialectic kind of it that way. Um, it was dependent on the movement of the front. There's no point in evacuating stuff if it's not going to be occupied, right? Uh, so it's entirely dependent on the movement of the front. But at the same time, its greatest achievements, where it is successful, were shaped by defeat and retreat. So I think just thinking about it in those terms uh, can enable you to conceptualize it a little bit better. Okay, so next. So here we see the evacuation of children from Leningrad as uh, the city is being encircled. And I think it just gives you a sense uh, of what was involved here in terms of evacuating people. Um, evacuation plans targeted not only industry, but they also included the evacuation of children who often went out of the threatened areas first without their parents, um, families, uh, the employees of uh, scholarly and cultural institutions, schools were evacuated, universities, state organizations, 
as well as all kinds of raw materials, grain, and even herds. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. People were targeted for evacuation by workplace. You could not go to the train station and buy a ticket. That was impossible. So, for example, ASU would have been evacuated, probably department by department. So at a certain point, history would have received a set of tickets through the head of your department and for people and their families. Uh, they would have been handed out, and everyone would have been told, show up at the railroad station. At this time, we will be boarding. And sometimes people had a day or two. Sometimes they had no time at all. Um, but that's how people went out. They went out in collective groups. And that's also something I think is often a little hard for Americans to conceive. We just think of our, oh, I'm going to the railroad station fast. I need to get a ticket, you know. Um, but that's not how it worked. It worked in large collective uh, groups by workplace with families that were then attached. So that in and of itself, huge challenges. Um, you had people being evacuated uh, who were um, old, sick, pregnant, people who were handicapped. This was not a, a population of young people like those that made up the army. Uh, these are people of all ages in all sort of states of health and uh, difficulty. So that was a huge challenge. How do you get all those people loaded on? How do you feed them? How do you care for them? Um, what kind of medical aid is available to them on route? So that was one really big uh, challenge. Um, another one was once people were moved out of the threatened zones, they had to be resettled. So you're talking about millions of people who now need housing, food, jobs, medical care. That too, think about that. Millions of people being all of a sudden dumped in a city. I mean, we have some of this now with uh, issues about migration, um, far, far less. And uh, let's just say we're not coping with it very well. Um, but these were some of the uh, huge issues uh, that had to be dealt with. Um, in addition, all of these evacuations were accomplished under severe constraints of transport and labor. The government was short of railway cars. There weren't enough railway cars to get out uh, people and machines uh, and also to get the troops to the front, get the food to the rear. I mean, all of it was just the system was under incredible stress. And um, there were also hundreds of thousands of workers that had already left the front. So we saw the woman railway worker. So the workforce, actually the able-bodied you know, workforce becomes heavily fed. Uh, and that too is, is another uh, big dish. Another thing is that machines in boxcars as we all know, can't produce any. So once those plants are packed up and loaded, there's going to be anywhere between a few months and a longer period of time before they can be transported to the east and then re-set uh, up uh, in some place uh, where they can start producing again. So the government understood that evacuation was going to cause a drop in the production of desperately needed armaments, right at the point that the Germans were overrunning the country. So that too, I would say, is a, is a major issue. And as a result, a lot of these plants were operating until the very last minute, which then created a kind of dilemma you can imagine what that must have seemed like. What's the point at which we signal that the front line, people in the local area signals, the front line is two miles away. The Red Army is retreating. We've got to have the boxcars now. We have to start packing. Do you signal that when the front line is 20 miles away? When it's two miles away? When the Germans are knocking at the door? and if you want to keep the plant producing for as long as possible, then you're cutting this margin very, very thin. Um, 
So that also, you can see in the archives, this was a, an operation that is so fraught uh, with a potential for error and also for enormous tension uh, in terms of getting the stuff out in a timely fashion. And as a result, throughout the summer of 1941, you have panic and confusion just raging along uh, this 1,000. And the Soviet for evacuation had very little time in which to master the challenges that were being thrown at it. So it was literally like sort of dealing with these things as they were being um, thrown at it. Okay, so how was this thing uh, accomplished? What happened? Well, first of all, the Soviet for evacuation was created. So this is a kind of blunt foresight here uh, in the wake of the invasion. It's created within two days of the invasion when the state and the party issue a very brief, strictly secret decree, you can read it now in the archives, uh, creating the Soviet for evacuation. Uh, there are eight state and party leaders that are selected to lead it, and each one of them is already the head of another major organization. So for example, heads of the industrial commissariats, heads of the railways, uh, head of the food industry, head of you know, various uh, bodies that are already going to have to deal with these questions. Initially, no decision was made to evacuate the industrial base. And that makes sense. Within two days of the invasion, Nobody had any idea how much territory was going to be lost. No one had any idea that the Germans were going to take the Donbass, the mining areas, right? Or were going to take so much territory. So this uh, notion that the industrial base was going to be evacuated, that only develops in time. But at first, the role of the SE was pretty simple. Let's get whatever we can, including people, out of the threatened frontline areas. That was the areas that are either subject to bombing, intense bombing, or blitzkrieg. Let's do that. Now, up to the invasion, and this is another sort of big issue, I think, in Soviet history, the state had promulgated the, largely through newspapers, through film, through media, that um, if a war began, a war did begin, uh, it would be fought beyond the pre-1939 wars. It was not going to be fought on Soviet soil. So the Red Army was powerful, it was invincible, there was a lot of that kind of um, thinking. However, on June 22nd, uh, the uh, Wehrmacht uh, and the Blitzkrieg overrun the country with all of its key elements. Um, so the first thing is you have heavy bombing, that kind of softens up the area. Then you have rapid tank advance. For those of you that are interested in military history, you know this is the classic pattern. Uh, and then um, followed by the infantry. Over on the border and take uh, a very large amount of territory. The Red Army falls back in disordered retreat. Um, and hundreds of thousands of Red Army soldiers are taken prisoner. Thanks. This is uh, an example of a uh, Holocaust by bullets, uh, which is what foreign the Holocaust took uh, in the uh, Soviet territory. This is already after the Red Army has begun uh, to march back west and to uncover uh, uh, shooting pits outside of every city, every village, and every town. The entire country is pockmarked with these pits. Um, Hitler's Barbarossa orders, which did not operate uh, in the taking of France or uh, the northern uh, countries, uh, go into effect. And these orders actually uh, tell um, the uh, Wehrmacht and the uh, Einsatzgruppen, or the special task forces that were attached to the Wehrmacht, uh, that they should, um, they ordered the mass murder of a civilian population. So the list 
of people that were to be murdered were all Jews, all partisans, or anybody maybe thought to be a partisan, uh, which became a mass murder order for anybody in the population that the uh, ran afoul in some way the German authorities. Resistors, anybody that was a Soviet official, so local mayor or member of the local Soviet, uh, your school board, your whatever, anybody that worked in any way as a local official was to be murdered. And of course, anybody that was carrying a communist party card, uh, all communists as well. And the mass shooting of the civilian population begins immediately by the Einsatz group and, uh, that were following the army. And this is just an example of what the Red Army now begins to discover uh, when it begins after Stalingrad to fight its way back west. As you can imagine, there's panic, there's confusion. Uh, local officials all along the border don't know exactly how to respond. The Red Army was retreating so fast and in such disarray, you know, there's a difference between ordered retreats and disordered retreats where units lose contact with their commanders, they lose contact with each other. Nobody knows what's happening at the front. Well, this was an example of the second time. Um, local officials had no information about where the front was even located. Where is the front? Moscow didn't know. The army commanders didn't know. And local people, local officials had no idea what was happening. So there's no information, credible information that anybody is getting. And as a result, people have no idea how to instruct the local population. Should people stay? Should they go? If you're living in a family with um, people that are in their 80s, do you really try to get everybody, like, go, go where? Go how? And this was especially true, I think, in villages, which were not near railway stations. Um, local officials didn't know what to do about important um, uh, industrial uh, factories, uh, collective farm machinery, all of this. Should they try to evacuate it? Should they abandon it? Should they blow it up? Should you make that decision as a local official that they're gonna blow? Uh, up something, when in fact, maybe the front isn't as close as the rumors are. So all of this was really, there's a lot of confusion about what to do. Uh, on June 27th and June 29th, so again, we're in the first week of the invasion, the government and the party issued two decrees, and these were aimed at quelling panic and providing direction. Uh, they are known as the scorched earth decrees. Um, the decrees basically said the following. They urged people, quote, fight to the last drop of blood, show courage, initiative, and daring. In other words, take responsibility. And the instructions are also unequivocal. They say, drive off the railroad rolling stock. Do not leave the enemy a single locomotive, a single boxcar. Do not leave the enemy a kilogram of bread, not a liter of gasoline. Collective farmers, scatter the cattle. Deliver grain to the state for shipment to the rear. All valuable property, including metal, grain, and gasoline, which cannot be shipped out, should be unconditionally destroyed. Nothing of value was to be left for now, if you think about the decrees, first of all, they place, place an enormous amount of responsibility on local officials who are forced to make rapid and difficult decisions in the absence of reliable military information. You can't make the decision to blow something up unless you have some idea of where the front is. Second, if you also think about the majority of the population here is rural. So, Scorched earth has deep implications for the local population. If no grain and no animals and no um, farm machinery is to be left, what's going to happen to the people who are not evacuated? 
Scorched earth implies that the entire population is going to be evacuated. But in fact, there were few provisions made, given the rapidity of the Wehrmacht, for getting people out of rural areas in which the roads were not good, the railroad stations were not close, and people had no access, certainly, to automobiles or anything on wheels, for that matter, except carts. If you get an example of what it looks like in a rural area uh, to try to move out. And for many people who felt like, I mean, she's just got a tiny baby. I mean, think like with a small child, many children, uh, a cart, um, with elderly people, um, how many of you would have made the decision to move the family out? Many people felt like they couldn't go. Uh, when they're pregnant eight months, they're really gonna get on a car, you know, do this kind of walking. Um, old people, how do you get them out? People on crutches. So a lot of people decided to stay and they remained. And for those who stayed, uh, and the Jewish population in particular, uh, many, many Jews throughout Ukraine and uh, Russia, uh, for that population, uh, they would remain behind and they died at the hands of the Germans. So that's the three million, uh, the two million that were lost uh, and murdered by the Einsatz group. So the Essie's first efforts um, were, to, as I mentioned before, to just get people out as quickly as possible. By summer, they began evacuating the agricultural base. Government leaders understood that if they didn't get out the herds, the grain, the sugar beets, um, the country was going to starve to death. And if the country was starving, it wasn't going to be able to produce the armaments that were in turn going to be able to put the Red Army uh, in the field. Um, so, Sugar beets and grain from the frontline areas under attack by this point in midsummer now receive priority over all over in all other industrial loads. It's just get the food out, get as much food out as possible. And in July, the SC begins evacuating equipment and herds from the collective farms. And here you have an example of what it looks like evacuating cattle from the frontline zones. This was one of the least successful of the evacuation efforts. As you can imagine, there are huge challenges in moving any kind of herd through war-torn country amid bombings, uh, crossing rivers, feeding and watering the animals en route, providing veterinary services, all of these things were very, very challenging. But in fact, huge convoys were created and crossings were built over the rivers. Uh, flotillas of every imaginable floatable device were pressed into service. Uh, the Germans bombed the crossings. There were massive stampedes. There were dead animals and people everywhere. But this exodus of animals continued for months. It continued by day. It continued by night under the light of the moon. They kept moving east. And by October, about 3 million pigs, cows, and sheep, and horses had actually successfully crossed the Geneva. Then there was going to be another, there was another major crossing <clears throat> when the animals reached the Volga. And, um, <coughs> uh, again, uh, an attempt to uh, get the animals across. In mid-August of that summer, the SC begins shipping out the newly harvested grain. So whatever's being harvested now is being shipped out. In August, as the Germans took more territory, the SC began focusing now on shipping out the industrial base of Ukraine, along the right bank of the Geneva River. And this is um, a painting which was done later 
but it again gives you a sort of sense of uh, loading up the um, crates filled with industrial machinery onto uh, boxcars. And you can see, if you look in the background, uh, you can see the explosions, um, the front uh, sort of coming closer during evacuation. Uh, in Dnipropetrovsk, um, workers began dismantling the great steel plants. Uh, Germans bombed the railway platform, which was jammed with uh, thousands of people who were waiting to evacuate. But actually, in August, uh, workers had managed to ship out 10,000 boxcars and more than 200,000 people by rail from Dnipropetrovsk alone. That feat was then repeated uh, throughout the country as the Germans conquered more and more territory. Similar uh, set of events in Zaporozhia, uh, where again, the great iron and steel plants were packed up. Uh, the Germans bombed a hydroelectric dam. There was a massive flood, there were fires, but they kept loading the machinery, leaving the plants, coming back in. And, um, by uh, early October, the Red Army was then forced to retreat from uh, the left bank, the eastern bank of Zaporozhye as well. Uh, but by that time, the metallurgical factories had been safe. So they had been successful in getting those plants. Uh, next one. So this gives us an example of now what happens after a journey of months. Um, evacuating almost 4,000 kilometers uh, to the east. People stepped onto the boxcars in their summer clothes. They stepped off in the middle of the snow falling. And a lot of times, uh, the workers actually began literally unloading uh, and reconstructing the plants on barren ground. The machines were producing under snowfall. And you can sort of see that here. They were starting to produce armaments as construction workers were building a structure around them. So there was enormous impetus to just get this going as fast as possible. These journeys, which should have taken weeks, often took months, took a very long time. Uh, for all kinds of reasons, uh, mainly having to do with the bombing of the lines, the need to reroute, uh, the need to um, repair the railroad lines, and reroute a lot of these echelons. But by the summer and fall of 1941, an efficient system, planned evacuation emerged. The SE's efforts involved local officials in a massive centralized effort. And I would say that panic was steadily conquered by plan. People were given collective uh, things they could participate in, and they did. We need you to do this, this, and this. Uh, and people stepped up to the plate to do that. Uh, by mid-July, the SC had established a system of accounting and enumeration. You can see this emerge in the materials in the archives uh, that enabled it to track every convoy and every box call. It was receiving uh, information uh, from every single railroad station that every echelon passed, receiving information from the industrial commissariats about when the stuff was packed up, where it was going, and when it had arrived at its destination. So at any given moment, it could pretty much track the placement of hundreds of thousands of boxcars that were en route to the east. By mid-August, the government made the decision to reconfigure the entire economy. So there was a five-year plan, so the EU operated to plan, which set production targets for every industry uh, output exchange, inputs, labor, all of that by plan. And in mid-August, already in 41, they had reconfigured the five-year plan, basically to include the shift of industry from west to east. So the entire economy and its production had been reconfigured. 
So this is a is the photograph of the same thing that you just saw in the painting. It's not quite as dramatic, but it is real. Again, a worker now setting up, uh, unloading, and uh, setting up uh, the machinery. This is machinery that uh, had arrived from Kiev uh, and was arriving in Sridlovsk, which is a uh, town in the Ural Mountains. Okay, just a couple of uh, comments about constraints. The biggest constraint on evacuation, and you know, I mentioned to you, it was only 22% of the population that got out through official evacuation. There were many more people that just left on their own and only about 37% of the pre-war value of industries. You could ask, well, what about the rest of it? Um, the biggest constraint is the lack of boxcars. And this is the thing that really emerged from the documents in the archive. I mean, in this kind of very powerful way. You have telegrams coming from the industrial plants to the SE. We're packed up. We're ready to go. Send boxcars. We've only got half of what we need. We're ready. Please, the front is 10 miles away, two miles away. The Germans are at the door. Please send boxcars. They're just fine. And that was true for even the ammunition and the aviation industries plants, which were so important to the war effort. They only received um, about half of the uh, boxcars that they actually needed to get in. And you can see that sort of working in real time. Um, another huge constraint, I don't know if we have any railroad buffs here, but for those of you who know anything about railways, well, it's like traffic. You cannot just put an endless number of rail cars on a line. If you do, you get gridlock. Um, so that's actually a mathematical issue. How many uh, cars, how many um, trains can be uh, accommodated on any given route at any given time. Um, and uh, that too was an issue, especially with the bombing and other things, uh, how much traffic these rail lines could actually be. That was a huge constraint. Um, and then finally, the railroad lines were constantly being bombed. So echelons would just come to a halt. And people could be stuck before something like this, right? For weeks on end, in the middle of nowhere, with no food. Uh, peasants would often come in from the surrounding area to bring food to the railway cars, but you could have a situation where you were just stuck. Uh, and then the trains would have to be rerouted. And so that too, coordinating all of that uh, was a huge issue. Okay, so a few points now just for conclusion. Um, many historians blame Stalin, sort of following Khrushchev, for the lack of military preparedness uh, and the defeats, actually, of the first 18 months of the war. They say that much of this could have been avoided uh, with better planning. But I would say in this case, one of the findings of Fortress Dark and Stern was that the organization of the home front unlike that of the military front, was actually very effective. And I think we need to take that into account. Now, thinking about the war as a whole, this was true not only of evacuation, but also of the ration system and of labor mobilization, which are the three main pillars, actually, of the Soviet wartime system. The SE's main challenge was not how to evacuate any single factory or town. That was our main challenge in New Orleans, right? But that was not the SC's main challenge. They actually mastered that through getting one place out. The challenge was the organization and coordination of evacuation along a 1,000 mile front that was moving with frightening. So could pre-war planning have accounted for that. I don't think so. There was just too many unknown variables um, for where the Germans were going to move, how fast, what territory was going to be lost, and what was going to be necessary. 
So in that case, I don't think having a better pre-war plan, and they actually did have many pre-war plans for that militia, um, would have been effective in dealing with this. This is the kind of planning in action that is occurring. There's planning, but it is a planning in action. And that in itself is an interesting concept. Second, the extensive experience of workers and planners and party leaders with the great industrialization drive of the 1930s, I think may defeat the evacuation process. So many of these plants were newly constructed. The workers had just built them in the 1930s. They built them, they knew how they ran, and they knew how to take them apart, and they did um, so that kind of knowledge, not only was it concrete, granular knowledge of how do I take apart this machine? How do we label it? How do we transport it? But also that experience of industrialization in which the Soviet Union essentially accomplishes in a decade what it takes you know, Western capitalism about 200 years to accomplish, that experience, I think, gave people the confidence Think big and to think this can be done. We did it in the 30s, just a short time ago. We can do this again. This is possible. We can set this thing up in the East. So, that ability to sort of plan, uh, to think big, to surmount the confusion and panic, I think these were some of the things that just gave the country the ability to think this is possible. As crazy as it was, this thing is possible. And last slide. So this is one of the new plants constructed in Siberia. These are young workers making bombs in um, 1943. Well, the evacuation of the industrial base from west to east had huge consequences. And one of those was that the East was very sparsely populated. So the state was going to have to uh, mobilize a labor force. And then most of those people were gonna to have to come from far. As men went to the front, women, teenagers, and pensioners uh, took their places in the factories. And you can see how young workers are here. There are probably about 14, malnourished, uh, maybe even a little younger. Parents were often eager to get their children into the defense factories because the ration was a little bit higher. Uh, and I think what you see here is um, another major element, actually, of the wartime experience. This was Soviet childhood, right here. Uh, and um, it was the wartime experience uh, for millions of people. but. That is a story for another day. Take hey, questions? Questions? I'll start. Uh, hello. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much. Uh, and I have two connected questions. Uh, the first one is about the painting used. They're so dramatic. So I wonder, could you tell us a bit more how these paintings were created and when? Um, and is it like uh, really coming from partially artist's personal experience, or was it like state order, really coming from Moscow or some uh, places that were affected by this evacuation? And the second question connected to the first, in general, about commemoration of uh, opera. Did you see any kind of remarkable differences how like military campaigns were commemorated in the Soviet Union and how, how front was commemorated in terms of timeline or anything else? So these are two fascinating questions, but I don't work on actually either one of them. So the second question is about commemoration. Yeah. Um, and I think there's a wonderful topic for someone. Uh, look, there's a lot of work that's been done on commemoration, right? And when it begins and uh, what forms it takes and how it changes over time. 
and how the myth of the war and the victory is used for various political ends and purposes, uh, mobilization purposes, et cetera. Um, I think there's a wonderful topic in looking at the differences, uh, how home front commemoration occurs and how uh, military front. I don't know if there are any differences because the book actually ends in 45, but for anybody who would like to do, maybe you would. Uh, yeah, I, do, yeah, yeah, topic. Topic. Yeah. I think it's a wonderful topic. Um, and it would require, of course, going through. As far as the paintings go, I don't know the answer to that. I know they were not painted during the war. They yeah. were painted after the war. And whether they were commissioned uh, or whether, um, you know, it, that, that distinction may not be a hard and fast one, right? Because um, artists often uh, had a sense of what uh, kinds of paintings um, would become either popular or what you know, things they could do to get into school or whatever, right? So uh, I don't know what the, but I, pe other people have asked me about those two paintings and I really would like to look into them, what the background was. Because they're just so- Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And you know, it's interesting too to see, actually Don, can you go back to the painting, the one I think it's unloading uh, machinery, the right one that was spears. This one is definitely prettified. There's no question. It's quite sanitized, right? It didn't look like this. It was much messier. Um, but uh, this one, um, the next one, I'm loading. Yeah. That's very dramatic, um, but it did happen. And in all likelihood, it didn't look something like that, right? When you think about it. Um, the mess, the, I mean, you get a sense of the cold and the emptiness, like, oh, we're here? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Could you speak to the challenges of doing archival research in this period of Soviet history? I mean, apparently the Soviets were fantastic record keepers, but were the source materials they used very dispersed or? Um, so the source materials uh, were primarily, they were in uh, a number of different places. Uh, one was GARF, which is the state um, archive, uh, state archive of the Russian Federation. That has all of the state materials. So the Soviet for evacuation, all of their stuff is there. And um, there was no way, even if Don and I worked on this book for a good decade, uh, there was no way I worked primarily with the, that set of findings. He was working with other things, that fund. Um, you could work on it for a life. That's huge, a massive, massive amount of material. Other materials like the stuff about panic uh, and confusion that's in the first uh, chapter, that came out of uh, reports that were being sent, desperate reports to Stalin, to the military Soviets to the uh, to government officials in Moscow about panic and all along the front lines. That's in the party archive. Uh, also the Communist Party archive is also in Moscow. And then the Academy of Sciences has a wonderful archive of, of collected materials uh, also as well. Um, then there was a labor mobilization. The committee that was responsible for that uh, has a huge fund in Garth. Um, so uh, Don worked a lot in uh, health. There's a chapter on health. Uh, he did a lot of stuff on um, materials from uh, health. Um, and I did stuff on food and on black markets. Uh, so all these things were there. Uh, not greatly, really focused, concentrated in Moscow because that's where the leading, um, uh, let's say all union archives are for the entire Soviet Union. Biggest challenge now is nobody's going to Russia. You can't go. And I suspect, you know, if you want to go and go, you can get into the archives. Um, but uh, I've had colleagues say to me, come, the archives are open, come. But, you know, the challenges are enormous to do that. So it's really, I feel like we have this golden age that lasted for probably from the early 1990s till now. I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I was wondering how, how accurate is the reporting? I mean, I'm kind of a little doubtful because 
so in the in the German archives, right, you, you find oh, uh, this infantry division captured 20 tanks that ran out of fuel, and they found 10 barges full of grain, right? I mean, they were, and, and that's not necessarily reliable. Is there people buying from the militiamen, right? I mean, so that's in the military archives. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's a lot of exaggerated um, stuff that they think they captured. Um, but then also, if I think about, for example, Soviet um, evacuation or Soviet um, dismantling of East German industries after the war, um, right, as, as part of reparations, that was totally botched. Uh, I mean, these factory, the entire factories were dismantled in East Germany, shipped to some place in the Soviet Union, took months, parts were missing, factories never went to work. Uh, the, the BMW factory in Eisenhower was, was a fantastic example. Um, and it was absolute false report. Right? So all of a sudden, you know, uh, the Soviet Union was producing these kind of BMW uh, motorcycles uh, uh, somewhere in the, in the East, and, and they never materialized. So, so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure there's no incentive to exaggerate numbers of, of evacuations. It may be that there was, but here you have to explain how did they supply the Red Army? Right? Sure. So something's being produced. So that does the credit. In other words, what you have to explain is how did production occur? Which is not to say, so there were loads, for example, that went awry. They even had, in other words, they couldn't buy them. Uh, and when you think about, you know, hundreds of thousands of boxcars headed east, there are loads that go. They actually had these evaco points where um, they were for loads that had gone awry. And then, in other words, this load, you can't figure it out. Where does it go? What does it belong to? And in the records, you have that also, what is this load? And they ceased trying to get that load to where it needed to go. Often they said, whatever local area it ended up in, uh, they would say to the plant managers there, go check out the load. And uh, if you need something from it, take it. Um, so is every figure correct? No. But when I look at page, you know, like pages after pages after pages of these cries for boxcars, right? And then the number that's actually that they're actually getting, the number that they manage to load, which isn't again always the number they're getting, right? It's less. Uh, the number that then arrives. Um, and you see these discrepancies. You're looking at this in real time, in a sense. Is it exact to the box car? Um, have we got some enormous fictive uh, thing being with the eyes are being pulled, the wool is being pulled over the eyes of the people in Moscow? Back to the matter is the factories are producing, and they're producing a lot. And if you look at the production figures, they are steadily rising. I mean, and that armaments are being made available on the field. So, you know, you, you have to explain, if you were trying to explain here uh, defeat, and I had just told you this story, you would say to me, wait a minute, it doesn't add up. But if you square, look at this story, which is kind of on the ground story, in relationship to, let's say, Mark Harrison's production figures, or anybody's production figures that, you know, at this point, I would say, a bit dead, okay, and they said, I mean, military strength said, this is roughly correct, right? Um, and you look at the delivery of armaments, the story is pretty much accurate. But, yeah. but is that really because of evacuation or new investment? I mean, Germany uh, manages to, to peak production in 1944, the peak of bombing, right? Um, so, so, and that's not because they're, they're, it's not because they're shifting industries that much, because they're constantly generating new ways to, to invest, right? So, so is that really evacuation that is bearing fruit in 1943, 1944, or is it also a new investment? That's a good question, um, but I think it's both. So, for example, in the East, the Donbass mines are lost, right? They're, they're blown. Uh, they throw in all this material and they just blow them up on the way out. They're non-functional for the Germans, they're non-functional and then the Red Army comes back to it. But in the East, they open up the Kemerova, the Kuzbas, the Kemerova parts. Um, that, a lot of that is new. There's expansion there, there's no question, yes. Um, but 
to run these plants, and these plants are all expanding. And another thing that happens with these plants is they are not set up as they were before. They are frequently joined to other plants. Um, there's not enough um, wood to create uh, the structures for them. So you have also these crazy marriages of plants uh, that are going on with one building now housing uh, meat and chemical plant. I mean, it's just crazy, right? Um, so you've got a lot of that also. But there is, I can oh, shoot, I'm sorry. Um, Oh, sorry. Um, there is uh, a whole new industrial base that is set up in the East. And I would say what percentage exactly of that is new? Uh, what percentage of it is this? Uh, I couldn't really tell you. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, first of all, I will say thank you. So, I'm going to go over two studies programs. So, you've given me a lot of detail on something that we reached at a high level. My question to you is this, is that as a former contingency planner and project manager, when you get into the planning and action that you mentioned, you rely on experience to make those critical calls and decisions. Where did that experience come from that they apply here? I think there is no experience, obviously, with evacuation, right? That's the, that's the first time and they're doing this. Uh, it's the first time anyone actually ever did it um, on this scale. Uh, I think these students came in industrialization in the 1930s, which when you think about it, um, so industrialization really takes off in 1929, goes through to 1941, they're still, you know, building stuff up. Um, this was a kind of a planned industrialization, it's very different than capitalist industrialization. And um, they had a lot of experience with planning. Uh, and I think that that was served them very, very well. In this case, enormously. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, how are destinations chosen within that arbitrary or within their uh, It wasn't arbitrary. Um, each um, so the industrial commissaries were feeding information uh, to the SE, uh, and they, for any particular plant to run, they needed certain inputs. So they were trying to cluster plants together, trying to make sure certain plants needed to be near coal deposits, other plants needed to be within a spur railroad lines. In other words, uh, stuff was being built, um, stuff already existed. So they had destinations, but in a lot of cases also, not all of this is neat and tidy, right? So there was um, something called rapid evacuation, which meant getting stuff out with no destination, just getting it out. Uh, and there was a lot of that as well. And then some, uh, in other words, once it's on the road and out of the, on the rail lines and out of the threatened frontline areas, then a sort of destination is chosen for it. And then, of course, you had a lot of stuff, as I mentioned, stuff that whole convoys that no one knew where they were. You had with the bombing, stuff was supposed to arrive within, let's say, a month. No one had any idea how long it was going to take for it to finally get there. Um, so there's a lot of, um, I would say, it, it looks neater than it was. Uh, but that's in the records too, actually. The, you get a sense of the chaos as well. I think something that I'd say, uh, the Volker mentioned in terms of you know, questioning some of these records, one thing that I found interesting, having just read the book last week, uh, was that the request for box cards remind me of, I think, to some extent, the Soviet system and these managers being victims of that system, meaning they overestimated what they requested, knowing that they would get less. Yes. So really, in part, the question also becomes, how much did they really need? How much did they really get? And I think the last ladder figure you actually know, but what then is the difference between what they needed and what they got, meaning what didn't they take with them? 
still remains a question. They all over requested. They knew to over request that was the inputs, right? Because they knew they weren't going to get what they really. But the people also that were supplying the commissary of railways knew perfectly well they were over requesting, right? So it's kind of like a game in a sense that's being played. Um, but we also do see, we know that a lot of stuff was left behind and then blown. Uh, stuff even that had been packed up was left behind. So they weren't getting exactly what they needed and the gaps are pretty big. And also in the archives, when you read the material, there's a kind of hysteria that comes through um, in some of the uh, you know, reports on the telegrams that if that's not faked, um, you get the sense of, you know, please hurry, you know, now it's almost like they don't even care anymore how many, but more. Um, Do you have any sense of the reaction on the German side? So, for instance, hypothetically, the Germans were going to be starting to seize all this industrial equipment and grain and so forth. And they probably were fairly chagrined to find that a lot of it had been taken or wasn't, wasn't usable. Did that cause them to kind of accelerate their plans anymore to kind of try and get ahead of the evacuation process? Or I don't know. Do you know? No, I mean, they, they felt like. They got a lot of stuff. Yeah. One one thing that is really um, astonishing is how little the Germans knew about the Soviet Union. They had no idea how many divisions they were. They, they absolutely underestimated the military promise of the of the Red Army. They even to the point of how many divisions are on the other side. They really had no idea. Um, but also they, they had a fairly little idea about the kind of industrial prowess of the Soviet Union. Despite like these long term um, uh, kind of economic ties between the Weimar Republic and so on. So, so uh, for, for, the, for the Germans, the first few months looked like major successes, and it was really filled with all of these reports about what they conquered and what they captured. And, and so, there's little awareness of, of these evacuations only later. Uh, that's when they really don't find a whole lot of stuff. In. Yeah, there's also a gap between German need for labor. Uh, Germans already have the hunger plan to some extent in the woods. They were going to live off the land. The executions of people helped that. Um, utilizing whatever the people had helped that. Uh, in some ways, I don't think they were necessarily chasing any railways to stop them. Um, and the real need for labor comes later when everything that, that could be evacuated was already evacuated. And this utter disregard for anything in Soviet, right? This utter contempt, the inability to see uh, the Soviet Union as anything as superior. I and mean, there's also a lot of, kind of ideological ideas that play into the way the Germans perceive the Soviet Union. I, I would argue that that totally blinds them to, to anything that, that is actually uh, opposing. But I know they were hoping, for example, uh, they knew about the Donbass mines area. They were really hoping to use those mines. Uh, and, um, you know, it is argued, I've seen it argued by military historians that, um, the and could correct me if I'm wrong, but that the Germans did understand that if they were going to fight a long war, which they thought they would need to do and not repeat the uh, let's say home front difficulties of World War I, they would need to be able to pump out uh, the grain and the, um, you know, a lot of the, uh, let's say, raw materials uh, that Soviet Union had. And I think um, my sense was they were certainly disappointed in the mines. Um, it turned out that the railroad gauge was different on Soviet territory. Uh, and they were also disappointed, I think. I'm not sure how much wheat they actually did manage. I imagine quite a bit to pump out, uh, to send back home. Um, yes, the, yeah. uh, you know, at the same time, you kill a large part of the labor force who seek to exploit it, right? If, if you do, then, then the Germans are constantly kind of acting their own hopes for exploitation of, of land and agriculture and industry. Right. Um, the, the, the Germans are there. Right, right. It's, it's German genocidal policies that undermine their hopes for 
And one question. Yeah. So um, what struck me in your, especially in your narrative, is this contra contrast between the success of evacuation uh, of these first months and the kind of disaster that the Red Army went through. And these both structures, like military and Hopron, they like the leaders had to act, I mean, in the same uh, conditions, uh, the lack of material resources, the lack of information, uh, huge country. So what were the reasons behind there is this success and there is this, well, not so successful. Okay. Uh, is it because, I don't know, um, leaders from our experience on this side, or it was the experience of experimentation as you mentioned before, or is there anything else? So that really would be a question, in a sense, I'd have to actually have a lengthy discussion with a military historian about, right? I do know that, and it would be an interesting one to con this contrast, but you've already picked up on this, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, I do know that military historians, not all of them think it was a total disaster. So, you know, the very first victory, of course, in which the Germans are actually driven back anywhere, you know, throughout all of Europe, is on the defense of Moscow. And that occurs in October of 1941. So there are military historians that don't see it. It's exactly through this Khrushchevian lens of, you know, total disaster. On the other hand, they do lose an awful lot of territory. I mean, one thing that comes to mind, and again, this is just... They have a lot of experience, the party and the state have a lot of experience with um, organizing in peacetime, a tremendous amount of experience uh, with um, industrialization, with mass mobilization, with um, people flocking into the towns, I mean, with mass building projects, all of this. They have far less, uh, they have experience with the Civil War, but that's really not comparable in many ways. And I'm not even sure the lessons of the Civil War, you know, Voroshilov and uh, uh, Budioni are out actually uh, by the uh, beginning part of the war because all of their lessons uh, seem kind of useless in light of tank warfare. Um, so that could be another reason also that um, it just, the experience of um, mobilizing a population to do certain things at home, building things, uh, it doesn't transfer to the military. And then, of course, the third thing is that there's this, and I don't know whether this was just for propaganda or what, but this was a very strong idea that they were going to fight beyond the Soviet Union borders. Um, and I imagine that that, too, kind of to some degree took hold of the military uh, and made them maybe overconfident. Uh, yeah. But also, I think it, aside from mobilizing for industrialization, it's the terror as well, which is a mobilizing process. Um, the ethnic uh, movement of large numbers of various populations, all of that technically is bureaucratic, right? Someone has to be on the other end of figuring out where they're going to be concentrated, how many trains, wagons, et cetera, are going to be needed, where they're going to be dropped off, et cetera. So they have experience, all kinds of experience, some of it good, some of it less good, but seemingly it all is useful in this context. So yeah, coming back to the question of experience. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.